Now let's turn our attention to a different type of data outcome. Instead of looking at continuous measures, we'll finally get beyond blood pressure and length of stay. We're going to look at binary measures, and we're going to look at the sample proportion as a summary measure for binary outcomes, and we'll look at the role of the central limit theorem with that. So proportions are something you've probably heard of, and we'll formally define them how we estimate them in a second, but there's many things in public health we're interested in that we could summarize with the proportion. Here are some examples. The proportion of individuals with health insurance, proportion of patients who become infected, etc. You can read the list. Proportion is an appropriate summary measure that arises when our outcome of interest is binary. That is, for each individual in our study, we record a binary outcome, yes or no rather than a continuous measurement. Computing a sample proportion, then, as our summary measure, this is frequently represented by the letter P with a carrot or hat on top, and it's actually pronounced P hat. The hat indicates it's an estimate. We compute a sample proportion by taking the observed number of yeses in our outcome divided by the total sample size. This is the key summary measure for binary data akin to the or analogous to a mean for continuous data. There's a formula for the standard deviation of a proportion, but it, it lacks the physical interpretability that it has for continuous data, so we'll, we won't bother with that for now. Let's look at an example of this type of summary measure employed. Here's results from a study showing the proportion of dialysis patients with national insurance across 12 countries. And for brevity purposes, I'm showing a table that only charts six of those countries. But if you look in this table, there's a lot of information, though, including the proportion of the sample of dialysis subjects from each country that had national health insurance. So for example, in Canada, this sample proportion, there were 503 Canadians and 400 of them have national health insurance, so our estimated proportion of Canadians that have national health insurance would be 400 divided by 503, or 0.796, roughly 80 percent. So another example here from a very famous study regarding the maternal infant transmission of HIV. So the HIV infection status was known for 363 births, 100 in the AZT group and 100 in the placebo group. So this study was mothers were randomized, pregnant mothers with HIV were randomized to receive either AZT or placebo during their pregnancy. And the HIV infection status was known for 363 births, 103 in occurring in, to mothers on AZT and 183 to mothers in placebo. 13 infants in the AZT group and 40 in the placebo group were HIV infected. So if we look at the sample proportions of infected infants in each of these groups, the P hat for the AZT group would be 13 out of 180, or 0.07, which is 7%. And the P hat for the placebo group would be 40 out of 183, 0.22, which is 22%. But of course, these are just estimates in all the examples we've looked at based on imperfect, hopefully representative subsets from larger populations. So we want to know something about the sampling behavior of a sample proportion. In other words, how do sample proportions estimated from random samples of the same size from the same population behave from sample to sample? Well, let's again do a simulation to look at this. And I think what you'll find is pretty interesting and perhaps surprising. Suppose we have a population in which 80% of the persons have some form of health insurance and 20% have no health insurance, so akin to what we think was going on in Canada based on that example we looked at. Assume the population distribution is given by the following. And this is kind of a silly graphic here because there's only two possible values of health insurance status, either yes or no. And I've coded in the database a one meaning yes, a zero meaning no. So in this population, 80% of the persons have health insurance. Suppose we still had all the time left in the world, left over from last time, because we got done that faster than we thought. So we decide to do another set of experiments. We're going to take 500 separate random samples from this population, each with 20 subjects. And for each of the 
500 samples, we will plot a histogram of the sample proportion of insured individuals and record the sample proportion. So let's get started. Here's the first sample. 20 observations. Here's the sample distribution. Two bars. And the height of the higher bar is our P hat. It's 90% of this sample had health insurance. Sample 2, 85% had health insurance. And so on and so forth. Suppose we did that 500 times. Let's look at the histogram of the 500 sample proportions. Here's a histogram of those sample proportions. And the mean of these 500 sample proportions is 0.805 or 80.5%. And the standard deviation of these sample proportions is about 9.4%. We'll come back to, to where that fits in after we look at the results of our other experiments. You see, I've superimposed a normal curve over this histogram, and it, the histogram's pretty crude, but it does exhibit some possibility of symmetry and bell-shapedness, although it doesn't fit that normal curve well. But just keep that at the back of your head. So suppose we go back and we do this again, but now we take 500 separate random samples, each with 100 subjects. And for each of the 500 samples, we'll plot a histogram of the sample proportion of insured individuals and record the sample proportion, just like we did before. So here are the results of two samples. One sample, 80% had health insurance. Second sample, 78% had health insurance. So let's just summarize after doing this 500 times. Let's look at the histogram of those 500 sample proportions. Look at this. Now we're starting to see something that shows some real evidence of being roughly symmetric and bell-shaped, and I fit a normal curve, a true normal curve, with the same mean and standard deviation as these sample proportions on top of the histogram. And you can see it's not a bad fit. And the mean of these 500 sample proportions is 80.1%, and the standard deviation is 4.1%. So we're going to do this one last time, and I promise this will be it for a little while. We're going to take 500 separate random samples from this population. And now we're going to have each time with 1,000 subjects. So for each of these 500 samples, we'll compute the sample proportion based on the 1,000 people in each sample and then look at the behavior of that across the 500 samples. So here's just an example of two random samples taken. The first one, 79.8% of the persons had health insurance. In the second one, 77.7%. But now let's look at the results across the 500 samples, focusing on the sample proportions. So let's look at the histogram of the 500 sample proportions. And wow, now you can see it's not only is it tighter than the previous two sets of results based on only 100 observations and 20, but it really does seem to be well described by the normal curve superimposed on top. And the mean of these 500 sample proportions is 79.9%, and the standard deviation is 1%. So let's just review the results, take them side by side. In this table, we were sampling from a population whose true proportion insured was 80%. And now let's look at the means of the 500 sample proportions for each run of sample sizes. You can see in all three situations they were hovering around 80 percent. The mean of 500 sample proportions each based on 20 observations was 0.805 or 80.5 percent. 80.1 percent for those each based on 100 and 79.9 percent for those based on 1,000. And you can see that the standard deviation in these 500 sample proportions decreased with increasing sample size. The more information each proportion was based on, the less variation there was in those proportions. And the shape of the distribution of the 500 sample proportions started approaching normality when each proportion was based on 20 and then showed some clear evidence of being approximately normal when the proportions were based on 100 or 1,000 observations. And here's a, just a box plot representation of these results, and we can just see that tendency towards normality and the decreasing variation with increased sample size. Been looking at the side-by-side -side box plots of the distribution of the sample proportions from each sample size run here. And in the next section, we'll show how to estimate characteristics of this sampling distribution from a single sample 
of binary outcomes, this will very much mirror what we did with continuous outcomes and means.